really a pleasure to be able to, to talk to you guys today. And it's really cool because my dad's in the audience today all the way from, from the US. My name is Matt. I'm an assistant professor at the Department for People and Technology. Um, I've been at Rook since uh, for about a year now, uh, after four years at uh, Aarhus as a postdoc. Um, my area of, say, interest in research is in the world of strategic foresight, right? And this is rooted in how organizations and groups of people make decisions, okay? So humans, as humans, one of our very kind of unique competencies one of many, is this ability to kind of foresee the future, to anticipate what's coming, and then integrate that anticipatory, say, information into our decision-making in the present. All right, studies have shown that we actually spend like about 20% of our time thinking about the future and trying to figure out what is it that we're gonna do next, right? And that's this world of strategic foresight. So foresight's kind of occupied a new space that business strategy left behind in the 1990s when it took a hard shift towards microeconomics as the basis for decision making. So there's another field of future studies and strategic foresight that kind of filled in that gap and it's been uh, kind of rolling for about the last 20 years. And we'll talk a little bit about what does this mean, right? Uh, because as we're very much rooted in the social sciences, if you think about sociology or the study of people in groups and how groups of people make decisions, AI has always been really on the periphery of, say, a management team that has to decide where they're going to play in their strategy and what they're going to do next and how are they going to win in a competitive kind of uh, market space, right? Or even in public institutions. So, um, again, we're going to do this one here and we're going to start you off with a with a, with a little thought experiment. I'm going to ask you to think about the last time you tried to, to predict the future. Right? We're not trying to try to predict a diagnosis of an x-ray or an MRI scan. The last time you actually thought about and trying, what did you try to predict? All right? The last time you tried to predict the future. It's a rhetorical question. It doesn't require an answer. Right? Now, follow-up questions, right? How long did you stay inside of that future? All right. Do you think we could find ways to stay inside of it to explore it a little bit longer, right? So in my case, it would have been this morning. My, my dad and I are getting in the car in Aarhus, and we know we got to be here in time for this event, right? And that's right, a four-hour trip from Aarhus, right? considering a couple breaks along the way map it out in the Google Maps, right? What's, how's, how long is that going to take to make sure we get here on time, right? So that structure of that thought experiment is this goal orientation. Where do you want to be at a future point in time, right? And then what are the steps that I need to kind of put into place to be able to reach that destination by that time, right? So in this world, this is called uh, the backcast, right? And that one might be here, right? So in the 1970s, right, when a lot of these uh, large companies, multinational companies, were trying to find out new ways to predict the future, right, they started teaming up with a lot of think tanks, right? And these think tanks were very much inspired by a lot of the military type wargaming sessions. Now, wargaming has been around for 3,000 years, right? At least as far as we know, it was used by the Greeks. Right, might be older than that, but this is kind of something of the world of the toolbox that we use, right, in strategic foresight as structuring our thought experiments in different types of ways in order to help us stay in the future longer so that we can either explore or anticipate or create better estimations, right, of, of what's in front of us. Okay? Um, and so the to the core question of strategic decision making or, or foresight is what is it that we should do, right? So as a social scientist, right, and, and with these kind of being my fellow fields, right, there's kind of two parts of this. One is this, how do we describe the world as we see it, and then how do we predict it, right? So there's either some of my colleagues will say, no, we're all just trying to describe the world, and some of my colleagues will say, no, we're trying to actually predict it, right? Um, so 
this, this, this talk here today is based on a, a, a paper that I wrote, and it was a really quick one because when the chat GPT came out in uh, November of last year, um, I could kind of see, you know, fiddling around with it, and I asked it to write some scenarios for the future of transportation. And I, uh oh, because that's one of those kind of core tools inside of this toolbox that I've been working with for a long time. So I said, okay. So I did. I was playing with it on a Thursday. I wrote the paper on a Friday, and here it's coming out now uh, as we speak. So if there's this theory of strategic foresight, it might sound something like this: is that everybody in this room or everybody in the world has some kind of mental model or say way of thinking about the way that the world works. And if we're able to harness these ways and collaborate a little bit differently through some of this structured method behind these tools, then we can come up with better strategy. So there isn't, but if there was a theory of strategic foresight, it might sound something like that. Um, and then why is it that we do do this? If you look at the cognitive biases or the ways and the problems that groups have making decisions and institutional constraints, how is it that uh, what are we trying to get past when we're making uh, these decisions? It might be found on some of these on this list. This is a slide that I've been using for a while. And this is a slide that I think I have to retire now. Because we used to say, look, some of these tools are workshop based. We'd get the groups together, we'd have you know, the whiteboard, right? We'd be working together as a group and trying to put post it notes up, right? There's workshop based. And then we have these other ones, these IT tool based ones, right? Where we could send them out, do it digitally, right? We wouldn't have to have the interaction, right? But I think that, I think it's now th this slide's done because of what, what we're going to see. So I asked it to predict the future. It says, ah, 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 not going to do that, right? It's inherently uncertain, right? Unpredictable events, right? I can provide some insights on historical data and trends, right? Maybe even offer you some potential scenarios, right? Please be more specific. Okay. So I asked it, again, this is the, the prompt that kind of sparked the paper. So I asked it to write some scenarios. It came, and in the near future, personal flying vehicles become a popular mode of transportation. Ooh, you know, that one's been around for a while, right? How about this one? Uh, teleportation becomes a reality. You know, if I took that one to Maersk and said, hey, no, you know, we're not going to be using container shifting, right? We're going to be teleporting containers, right? That's when you get thrown out of the room, right? Um, <clears throat> and then self-driving cars become the norm. Okay, that's, that might be a little bit more on the plausible side. So I wrote another paper that, um, on what is the scenario. Uh, but this is kind of back uh, during my PhD. And we're trying to think about what are the criteria that it takes to become a, uh, a scenario, to define something, at least in some of these traditions of strategic foresight, right? Um, if the phenomenon is not in the future, right? We're talking about like a counterfactual or an outcast where people will say something like, now that we find ourselves in this scenario right here, right? We wouldn't really, that wouldn't really qualify. That criteria would kind of get kicked out because it's not in the future, right? So. Um, what is it about something that's outside of our control? If it's inside of our control, we're talking about prefactuals. So that's something like, how would, we, um, how would we need to position ourselves if we build the factory in India or in China today? Right? So we have this option. We could build a factory in India or China. What would our future look like? Right? I see the structures of the thought experiment start kind of getting a little bit more uh, it'd say, say nuanced. So is it, is it a story, right? And if it's not, we're talking about like single point forecasts. You know, what's the price of a barrel of oil at the end of the year, for example? It's not really a scenario. If you bound it with sensitivity and confidence, right, we're talking about a sensitivity analysis, right? Is it plausible? Now, this is kind of where I said, with the trans teleportation scenario, I said, uh-uh, that doesn't work because now we're in science fiction or future fantasies or dystopias or utopias, right? Because those are not plausible. As an organization, does it really, is it really a good use of our time to plan for when aliens come to Earth? 
Well, probably not, because if that happens, you know, all bets are off. The world's so much different now that aliens are here that why would we really spend our time planning for it? So when we're trying to create these scenarios and when organizations are creating scenarios for themselves to help them plan, right, it's important that they keep them plausible, right? And then we have them in systematized sets and, and they're different for different reasons, right? So, okay, so I asked ChatGPT, what are the qualities of a scenario? What are the qualities that define a scenario? It said, oh, they gotta be relevant. That's good, not on my list, but that's a very good one because scenarios are built for somebody, for something, right? Otherwise, they're just floating out and they're useless, right? So they're very kind of pointed towards an end goal. They got plausibility, clarity. We don't have that one in here. We took that one for granted, maybe. Right? Completeness is another one. Ah, you know, maybe some of the systematized set and comparatively different. Scenarios need to be flexible. I don't know if I agree with that, but if you've got a set of them, maybe they don't need to be individually flexible. Because how would you know how to plan for a flexible scenario? I don't know. I don't know how to do that. Internal consistency, right? So you can't have, uh, you know, flying pigs with purple tutus on. That doesn't really, it breaks the laws of physics, not really worth our time again. So I would put that maybe into the plausibility or the logical inconsistency inside the scenario and the, are they actionable, which I would tie that one back up to the relevance. But good, not bad. So I just asked this chat GPT thing, say, hey, uh, you gave me this scenario. Can you make it more plausible, right? Can we use these? In the near future, teleportation becomes a commonly used mode of transportation. It still has limitations only available for short distances at designated teleporting stations with safety measures and regulations in place. Cool. Okay. <laughs> but does that really? Okay. So imagine that that was the case. So then we could put it back into the plot and then follow it down to see if we can find other criteria. Of course, in the paper, I was cherry picking this example, right? Yeah, so that's the toolbox. But what is it that we're figuring out that in this theory of, of strategic foresight, right, where we have lots of people with lots of different mental models in their heads, and these tools require different structured thought experiments that require inputs and answers to questions, right, to create better strategy that we're going to find uses for this. Right? It may not be able to help us predict the future, but it will help us, help, will support us in our inquiry in new ways. Um, so then um, another one of those tools in the toolbox is called the futures wheel. Right? So this is the one that the futures likes to use. And they put in the middle an event, a tr an event or trend, and then they go around the circle, say, what's the pestle analysis? What's going to be the impact right, of this event or trend like chat GPT? Right? And then they got the first order effects would be inside there, and then they go, oh, then if you take that around again and run the circle, right, we're looking to stay in the future longer and explore these futures, right? And we're looking for these different kind of second order effects. Well, somebody beat me to it, found this on LinkedIn, they did it for ChatGPT, right? And they ran this futures wheel, and I, I found a few good ones right here, like more research and patents. Right? I think that the speed and the support of ChatGPT right, is going to really accelerate a lot of the things that would usually take a long time, like writing for us, so scientists. Here's one, more time for employees to be creative. How much time do we spend filling out paperwork right, in this world? Right? Let's free some of that time up. Here's another interesting one, decrease in trust levels. Right? Now, this is, if you follow this backwards, fake, fake people or fake personas and fake news, right? New businesses starting based on this. And I think that if you, if you notice what's happening in, in uh, let's say, the world of Twitter or the world of lists or content marketing, I, th I think I can already start smelling chat GPT behind some of these texts that I'm reading, right? Like this is, this is, this feels unnatural, the way that this is written, right? And I think that there's a trust issue here now 
for the people who have been in marketing and sales, right, when they have to push out content marketing, I think that we're going to have a, even less trust in the messages that were being delivered now, right? Anyway, that's just a few, uh, a few things about that. Um, but the futures wheel, cool, right? Works really well. And then this guy responded to this model here because he, he had a disclaimer. He says, this is to completely made by humans. And this guy came behind him and says, okay, let's, let's not make it by humans then. Let's see what it works, how it works. And he writes this prompt using the futures wheel combined with the pestle, blah, 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 blah. And here it comes, the answers, right? And it's, you can use actually now the futures wheels as prompted by ChatGPT to try to come up with at least iterations of this stuff that we would use hours and multiple people's hours in workshops. And these, like these scenarios that it's coming up with, right? These were workshop-based activities to come up with scenarios that were maybe perhaps a bit more plausible, but still raw material and the outputs of these, right? Uh, of these prompts are getting us a lot closer now to also being irrelevant in the world of decision making, right? Assuming it can, it can take that. So we see impacts on all three sides from ChatGPT. Pretty convinced of that's going to happen. Here's a nice one. So I think that the title of this talk was, you know, what jobs are in, in danger from ChatGPT. And OK, my job is to help people predict the future, think about the future as an academic. And my job is really to help improve those tools so that when they're used out in the world that they, they do what we would hope them to do. Here's, so here's a, here's a, ask it to write a job application. So imagine somebody who doesn't have a job, right? But their job is then kind of to write job applications. So now even the people without jobs are not going to have a job because chat GPT can write the job application for them. Right. Um, Here's another one, HR and, and legal. Now, this, this, is a, this, is a, this is a big business, by the way. Ask it to write a contract between two parties based on this transaction. Ask it to write a living will. Ask it to write an employment contract, a non-compete clause. That's the legal profession, right? That's their bread and butter when it comes to retail legal, right? I stop here for time, but it, I, I think that the message that I'm going to say is, is you guys, um, probably the people in this room have been saying this for a long time, and that this is going to be this hybrid future. But as social scientists, right, in sociology, political science, even some of the more, uh, say, humanities, I think that we're also now facing, I think, some of these changes from AI that we haven't faced before. Right, so we're kind of late to the party here, right? Uh, that I think that, that's been driven by the engineers and has been driven by the doctors, right? Uh, up until now, like we've seen. So, so that was it. That was my talk. And I want to say thank you very much and for your time. <laughs>